Welcome to our next lecture on the nuclear organization of the genome. Don't copy and distribute. So the main learning objectives of this lecture are to learn about uh, the purpose and mechanics of techniques for measuring genome-genome uh, and genome-protein interactions, like ChIP-seq that we've uh, learned about recently, DAM-ID and hi -C. Uh, in particular, we want to make sure we know the limitations and the advantages of each of these technologies. Uh, we also want to make sure that you understand what exactly a LAD is and a TAD is, and how they relate to each other and genome organization. And we'd also like to make sure you understand how to interpret uh, high C data, so more specifically, uh, the heat maps are that are typically associated with high C. And so you want to make sure you understand what, a, what it means for a high C heat map to be block diagonal, what do interactions uh, on the diagonal represent, how do we identify TADs, um, and you know, how do you identify certain regulatory structures like super enhancers, uh, as well as where do, where do biases typically come to play in high C data analysis. And so to motivate uh, this lecture here, I'm showing you a transmission electron microscope image of a mouse pancreatic uh, nucleus. And so here you can see that the nucleus is approximately about six micrometers long. And within that six micrometers, uh, this mouse cell has to fit about two meters worth of DNA into it. And so obviously the DNA has to be packed in some way uh, to be able to fit into a six micrometer diameter nucleus. And it has to be packed in a way that allows it to be folded and unfolded quickly uh, in, a, in a controlled way such that you can properly express all the different genes and uh, elements within your genome. And so to achieve this packing of the genome into such a small nucleus, uh, the genome is organized at different scales of resolution. And so at the most fundamental level, of course, the genome is a linear uh, linear DNA sequence, and as you are probably aware by now, um, DNA is typically wrapped up uh, into nucleosomes, and not all regions of the genome are wrapped up into nucleosomes. And so, at a basic level, your uh, your genome has regions that are wrapped up into nucleosomes, and those regions that are nucleosome free. And so, uh, we'll discuss uh, histones and nucleosomes uh, more in the epigenomics lecture. And so this uh, lecture will tend more to focus on higher levels of genome organization. So the organization of entire chunks of your chromosomes into what's called topologically associated domains or TADs. And so a TAD is basically just a contiguous segment of one chromosome uh, for which you tend to find a lot of physical interactions between loci within a TAD as opposed to interactions between some part of a TAD and out some region of the genome outside of the TAD. And so TADs are just, in some sense, uh, a somewhat loosely com compartmentalized section of your chromosome for which you find a lot of interactions uh, within that TAD. Um, and at an even higher level than the TADs, <coughs> it turns out that uh, entire TADs can consist of either regions of the genome that tend to be highly associated with transcriptionally active elements. And there are also TADs that tend to be tend to consist of uh, regions where most of the uh, most of the TAD is transcriptionally inactive. And so you can actually have multiple TADs that group together and interact with each other as well. And those uh, those groups of TADs that uh, are transcriptionally active and tend to interact with each other are called the A component. Uh, whereas the groups of TADs that tend to group together and uh, represent transcriptionally inactive regions of the genome are what are called the B components. Um, it's, it also turns out that entire chromosomes as a whole don't, random, don't really randomly distribute themselves around the nucleus. And so certain chromosomes are known to have certain preference uh, for location within the nucleus. And so even at a kind of macroscopic level, uh, chromosomes, for example, tend to segregate into different regions or what are known as chromosome territories. And so the majority of this lecture is going to basically be about discussing different ways of um, different experimental uh, assays for measuring uh, genomic loci interactions. 
And so they, bas they basically fall into two categories. Either you're measuring the interaction of genomic loci with um, what's known as relatively fixed nuclear landmarks, such as the nuclear lamina, um, which I'll talk about in a second. And so that involves using techniques like ChIP-seq or DAM-ID. Um, and the other set of interaction, the other set of assays help you measure interactions between genomic loci. And so this involves techniques like 3C or HI-C. And so we'll start with the assays for measuring interactions with the nuclear landmarks. And so again, this involves techniques like ChIP-seq and DAM-ID. And so the general idea is that these nuclear landmarks, in particular the nuclear lamina, uh, consists of a dense network of proteins. And, and these proteins basically associate with uh, different regions of the genome. And so you can use uh, techniques like ChIP-seq or DAM-ID to basically identify DNA segments that are um, bound by the proteins present in these landmarks, such as the nuclear lamina. And in doing so, you can identify which regions of the genome, for example, are associated with the nuclear membrane. And so just briefly, again, the nuclear lamina, again, is a, is a network of, uh, of proteins, uh, of which the vast majority of the protein content consists of different lamin proteins. And so the general idea is that uh, we want to identify which genomic segments are in close contact with lamin proteins. And because these lamin proteins are associated with uh, the nuclear lamina, and the nuclear lamina is associated with the nuclear uh, membrane, then we can essentially figure out which, uh, which parts of the genome are typically associated with the nuclear uh, membrane and therefore are on the periphery of the nucleus. And so there are two main assays for measuring protein genome interactions. And so you've already been introduced to ChIP-seq. And so very briefly, we can uh, use antibodies specific to lamin proteins to pull down regions of the genome that are associated with the nuclear lamina. Uh, another technique that you can use is called DAM-ID. So DAM-ID uh, relies on the protein domain called uh, DAM-methyltransferase. And so the idea is that this DAM domain is basically capable of methylating adenine in a sequence motif of GATC. Uh, and so if you create a fusion protein of, for example, DAM with, uh, with one of the lamin proteins, then basically what happens is that with DAM tethered to lamin, uh, DAM will basically methylate uh, the GATC motif uh, if, uh, if the associated lamin is close to a region of the genome that also contains that motif, GATC. And so in the DAM-ID assay, you run a pair of experiments. In the first experiment, you create a fusion protein between DAM and lamin V1. And what's going to happen is that all, all of the adenines that are uh, within a GATC motif that, also tends, that is also residing near the nuclear lamina where the lamin V1 protein uh, resides is going to get methylated. Uh, in the second uh, experiment, what you're going to do is you express the DAM protein domain uh, on its own, and then the adenine in the GATC motif, uh, in theory anywhere in the genome, uh, not just the regions associated with the nuclear lamina, will also get methylated. And so the key point here is that a methylated adenine uh, occurs relatively rarely in most eukaryotes, and so what you can then do is that uh, in both the foreground and the control experiment, you can use uh, specific restriction enzymes that recognize uh, methylated adenine uh, and will cut at the methylated adenine, uh, will then allow you to uh, isolate and identify regions of the genome uh, that have that uh, adenine methyl group. And because again, it's that methylation event rarely happens in eukaryotes, then wherever you see those reads mapping is basically will tend to correspond to regions that are associated with the nuclear lamina in the foreground experiment or anywhere in the genome in the case of the control experiment. And so just like with ChIP-seq, by comparing where your reads land in your foreground versus your control experiment, you can get an idea of which regions of the genome are uh, associated with the nuclear lamina in your cells that you targeted.
So once you get your reads from your foreground and control experiment for DAM ID, what you can then do is uh, you can intuitively plot uh, your distribution of reads across the genome. So here, the x-axis represents chromosomal position, and the y-axis represents the log two ratio of reads uh, mapping to a particular genomic location uh, in the foreground divided by the background. And so what that means is that a value of zero means that you see uh, about the same number of reads from both your foreground and your control experiment. And so there's no uh, particular enrichment for lamin-associated uh, regions. Uh, if you see very strong positive values, then that indicates that there is uh, potential for enrichment of uh, lamin-associated domains, and negative means that it's not likely to be a LAD. And so here, basically I've indicated using yellow boxes um, where potential LAD calls would be across the genome. Um, and so basically, intuitively, you can't, you wouldn't really call a LAD every time you see a little spike above zero because um, there is noise in where the mapping occurs. And so um, generally speaking, LADs are only really called where you see a whole region of a chromosome um, where the values are all above zero. Um, but here's an example of uh, some potential LAD calls for one region of a chromosome. And so from these LAD calls across the entire genome, you can basically come up with some kind of uh, hypothetical model of which regions of the genome are associated with the lamin. Um, and so one of those possible models is shown here on the bottom, where uh, basically yellow regions of the chromosome are uh, used to indicate where the regions that are associated with the nuclear lamina is. Um, those little black lines, the short little black lines represent H3K27 trimethylation, which is an epigenetic mark of uh, basically heterochromatin, um, or basically transcriptionally inactive regions of the genome. And you can see, generally speaking, that uh, K27 trimethylation sits near, for example, uh, LADs in the genome. So people have generally uh, spent a lot of time characterizing what kinds of genomic features are associated with LADs uh, compared to regions of genome outside of LADs. And so generally speaking, regions uh, inside of LADs are generally uh, gene poor. Uh, the genes that are within LADs tend to be more poorly expressed than genes outside of LADs. There's a lot of epigenetic marks that are generally associated with inactive transcription uh, found within the LADs. And more interestingly, in terms of the boundaries of the LADs, so the junction between uh, LADs and non-LAD domains, uh, you'll tend to find a lot of, for example, like CTCF binding sites or CPG islands, uh, and even promoters of genes uh, that are pointing in the direction opposite of the LAD. So they're the genes are facing outwards with respect to the LAD boundaries. So in this lecture, we mainly talked about using DAM-ID for the purposes of uh, identifying associations between lamin and uh, nearby genomic regions. Uh, it's worth pointing out that DAM-ID is actually pretty flexible, and so you can use it for a wide range of, uh, of assays. And so, for example, you can fuse the DAM protein domain to, in theory, any transcription factor uh, that binds DNA and therefore identify potential binding sites of uh, any given transcription factor. Um, this, of course, has all the limitations that we discussed with respect to creating fusion proteins between TFs and uh, certain epitope tags that you could use to do chip seq with. Um, in addition, of course, because DAM only recognizes adenine uh, in the GATC motif, this means that you won't actually be able to identify binding sites of TFs that aren't near that GACT motif. Uh, part B of this figure shows that you could create a fusion protein between, uh, for example, our, uh, components of RNA pull 2 uh, with DAM so that you can then kind of observe uh, where transcription is happening uh, because basically you'll see methylated uh, adenines near in the GATC motif wherever RNA pull 2 is, uh, is transcribing. Part C just illustrates that um, DAM has a strong preference for 
uh, methylating accessible adenines in the GATC motif. And so uh, basically GATC motifs that exist in, uh, in like regions of the genome that are wrapped up in histones, for example, are much less likely to be methylated. And so in some sense, you can use DAM to uh, try to identify open chromatin regions, which are again, kind of associated with generally active transcription. Uh, part D just illustrates that um, you can even use DAM to identify some types of RNA-DNA interactions. And so one type of epigenetic regulation is uh, what's called R-loop formation, which is basically when um, RNA uh, actually forms a uh, hybrid duplex with DNA. So you get an RNA-DNA duplex. And so the formation of this duplex can be associated with, for example, transcriptional repression. Um, and so if you want to identify where this uh, R-loop formations are happening, what you can do is you can take your RNA of interest, uh, you can engineer a what's called an MS2 tag, which is basically a stem loop secondary RNA structure. And this MS2 tag can basically be rec recognized by a protein domain called the uh, MCP coat, or sorry, the uh, MS2 coat protein, uh, labeled as MC2 or MCP. And so if you create a fusion protein between MCP and DAM, basically wherever this MS2 tag forms, um, then you'll basically uh, have DAM uh, methylating adenine in the GATC motif, and therefore that will give you some indication as to uh, R-loop formation. Part E of this diagram just shows that you can actually uh, use DAM to uh, detect interactions between transcription factors. So for example, uh, DAM is, again, it's a protein domain that forms a 3D structure, and so you can, in essence, split the DAM domain in, say, two, such that uh, basically uh, if either half of DAM, and basically if you uh, create fusion proteins where half of DAM is fused to one TF and the other half is fused to another TF, then basically DAM will only be active if both halves are uh, proximal to each other on the genome, which will only happen if uh, TF1 and TF2 are co-located and bound to their uh, proper DNA body sites nearby on the genome. And so basically part F also illustrates that if you create a fusion protein between uh, some transcription factor and DAM, for example, you can sometimes detect uh, not just uh, methylated adenines near local binding sites of the TF, but if the TF is assisting in, for example, causing uh, loop formations, uh, right, looping in your genome, then basically you should also see uh, methylated adenines in the region that is kind of looped around uh, and brought close to the, for example, promoter, uh, just because of you know those uh, those adenines in the GATC motif in the, for example, long range enhancer uh, will also get methylated if they're close to the dam uh, protein domain. And so that concludes our discussion of the dam ID uh, assay. And so we'll now move on to different techniques used to measure uh, interactions between genomic loci. And so I mentioned that there's a rather large number of such techniques. So some of them include 3C, 4C, 5C, HiC, and Chia Pet. Um, we'll mainly talk about uh, the HiC assay. Uh, but generally speaking, all of these assays are uh, predicated on the idea that if you cross-link DNA such that genomic loci that are physically proximal to each other, I uh, get cross-linked together, then the cross-linking uh, results in them basically being stuck together and you essentially form a read out of uh, sequences from both uh, genomic loci that are stuck together. And the mapping of those reads to the genome tell you essentially which genomic loci were in close physical proximity. So the basic question is why do different genomic loci that are potentially distal to each other on the linear chromosome end up being close in physical space. And so the first reason is that um, there could be like protein-protein interactions um, that come from, for example, enhancer-promoter interactions. So for example, transcription factors that are bound at enhancers uh, at some point typically need to physically interact with factors that are present at the promoter of a target gene. And so when that happens, obviously something like um, chromatin looping has to happen. Uh, and second way you can get close proximity is that uh, you can have what's called bystander interactions where 
uh, it's not that two genomic segments are actually in physical contact for functional reasons. They could just be in close proximity because they're nearby other sites that are bound. A uh, third reason is that because chromatin is, you could essentially think about it as like a, as a really long polymer chain, um, that means that genomic regions that are close in linear sequence will also tend to be physically close in space in the nucleus. And so uh, you'll get a lot of like non-specific interactions between physically close uh, genomic loci. And finally, uh, because of in interactions with uh, the fixed nuclear landmarks uh, like the uh, like the lamina, um, you can get close proximity of two genomic regions just because they happen to also be, for example, contacting the same uh, nuclear landmark. Again, not necessarily because they're actually physically interacting per se. So most of the technologies that people use based on sequencing to detect interactions between genomic loci are based on uh, what are called 3C technologies or chromatin confirmation capture. Um, and so 3C based technologies include um, what you might call like the classic 3C approach, uh, 4C, 5C, Chia Pet, and Hi C. And so all of the 3C based technologies share uh, a common step for generating a chimeric DNA fragment. And so the general idea here is that uh, if you take your native chromatin and you cross-link uh, with, for example, formaldehyde, so recall that uh, cross-linking uh, can cross-link proteins to other proteins or proteins to DNA. And so after cross-linking, uh, what you typically do in these 3C, 3C technologies is that you then digest using some uh, restriction enzyme that cuts reasonably frequently, so something like HIND3 is a classic uh, restriction enzyme you use for uh, 3C technologies because it, it's what you call a six cutter. So uh, it's recognition sequences, uh, six base pairs. And so that means that it cuts every about four kilobases, four kilobases in, the, in the genome. And so what you end up with after you use your restriction enzyme is that <clears throat> you'll generally speaking end up with a lot of fragments including basically uh, distal genomic loci that are cross-linked together because of, for example, protein-protein interactions uh, that are present where one protein is bound on each fragment. <clears throat> and so what happens is that after you uh, digest with the restriction enzymes, you then perform a ligation step where basically the free ends can ligate together from the uh, two distinct loci. And then after you reverse the cross-linking and purify, then what you end up with in principle is a lot of um, what's called chimeric DNA fragments, where part of the fragment comes from one genomic loci and part of the fragment comes from the other. And so uh, what's important to note here is that uh, here I've indicated that um, at the terminal ends of the chimeric DNA fragment, as well as in the middle, you basically have uh, HIND3 restriction, uh, restric restriction sites uh, because HIND3 was used in this case. Uh, for uh, for fragmenting the genome. And so these HIND3 sites are going to be important uh, in the later steps of describing the 3C technologies. So the classic 3C approach is what's known as a one-to-one -one, uh, region approach. And so the idea here is that after the cross-linking, the reverse cross-linking step that I uh, talked about in the last slide, uh, basically all you need to do is anneal sets of primers where uh, your primer set consists of primers uh, targeting regions from locus 1 near the known HIND3 uh, restriction enzyme sites and also from uh, locus 2 near uh, the restriction enzyme sites uh, of HIND3. And so because your primers are specific to regions near uh, the HIND3 cut sites in locus 1 and locus 2, then you're basically only going to amplify uh, fragments corresponding to regions from locus 1 and locus 2 uh, that are in close proximity. Um, and so because your primer sets are specific to each locus, uh, that means that uh, realistically your primer set really only covers like a few hundred KB uh, for each of the two loci. Um, and so again, 3C, the classic version anyways, was a one-to-one. Uh, or one region against one region type approach. 
Uh, it's worth pointing out that uh, more recently, people have kind of revisited the classic 3C approach and modified the approach uh, in order to produce a protocol called 3C Seek. And so the idea of the 3C Seek approach is that uh, similar to the 4C uh, based approach that I'll talk about on the next slide, uh, use a more frequently cutting enzyme, something like DPN2, um, that'll produce shorter fragments. Uh, and then what you do is you directly ligate uh, sequencing primers uh, on the on the terminal ends of the fragment, and then you just kind of sequence all of the fragments. And so in theory, um, your chimeric reads can come from anywhere in the genome, not just the ones that you've designed specific primers to. The next approach we'll talk about is called 4C, or what's known as circular 3C. And so 4C is an approach that's known as uh, one against all, uh, because you're really uh, asking for interactions between one locus against the rest of the genome. And so uh, in the 4C protocol, basically what you do is after you reverse the crosslinks uh, from the from two slides ago, basically the idea is that again, you use kind of like a more frequent uh, cutter, what's known as like a four cutter, such as DPN2. And so DPN2 basically has a, a recognition site of four base pairs, which means that it cuts every 256 base pairs or so. And so the idea is that after you cut with this secondary cutter, like DPN2, uh, you end up with a shorter fragment that's still chimeric. Um, and you can basically circularize this fragment. And then what you do is you, similar to the 3C, the classic 3C approach, you then anneal primers that are specific to your target locus um, and do PCR or sequencing. Uh, the difference with 3C is that your primers are actually still uh, only targeting one locus, that's your locus of interest. But and this time also, your primers are targeting not just uh, sequences near the HIND3 cut sites, but also the DPN2 cut sites, because basically your chimeric fragments should have uh, one HIND3 site and one DPN2 site. And so basically, by targeting uh, both ends of uh, your both ends of the fragment corresponding your target uh, locus of interest, uh, you're going to again get these chimeric uh, fragments, which you can then sequence, and then through mapping, uh, you can then figure out which other regions in the genome are interacting with some locus near your, uh, or are interacting with some fragment in your locus of interest. So the last 3C-based technology we'll talk about today is called HI-C. And so HI-C measures all possible pairwise interactions between different genomic boci on the genome. And so just like the previous 3C technologies we talked about, you, the assay starts by cross-linking, isolating, and then digesting with your standard restriction enzyme, HIND3. Um, but after digestion, what you do is you add biotin to the ends of your fragments. And so biotin is a small vitamin that is pretty popular uh, for labeling uh, both DNA and proteins because the biotin doesn't really interact with uh, protein or DNA. And it's, it has a really high affinity for um, another molecule called streptoviodin, uh, which basically means it's easy to isolate biotin-labeled uh, molecules. And so uh, after you add biotin to the ends of your fragments, you perform a ligation step to generate chimeric reads and isolate your DNA. And then Basically, the point of the next step of the assay is that after you remove, so it's possible to remove biotin uh, from the ends of your fragment while leaving biotin that labels interior nucleotides uh, intact. And so the idea here is that um, the ligation step uh, of the 3UC-based assays is not perfect. And so uh, while in principle, what you hopefully should get is ligation of uh, your two fragments corresponding to different loci on the genome, uh, sometimes what will happen is that you might not get any ligation at all. Um, and so basically to distinguish, for example, fragments that had no ligation versus fragments that did ha have ligation, basically fragments that did have ligation uh, between two separate fragments will be identifiable because they'll be the ones with biotin uh, labeled nucleotides on the interior. And so the idea of step D of this assay is that once you remove biotin from the ends of the fragments and you do some fractionation to make the fragments shorter, 
basically only the uh, only the chimeric reeds will have biotin on the interior uh, of those uh, sheared fragments. And so what you can then do is you can use um, you can use the fact that biotin is labeling some of the interior uh, nucleotides of the uh, chimeric reads, and you can pull down those reads specifically with uh, streptovidin uh, coated magnetic beads because uh, biotin has super high affinity for streptovidin. Um, and so once you pull down the sequences that are specific, um, that specifically have the biotin labels, uh, what you can then do is you can uh, ligate some sequencing adapters and then just do some deep sequencing. And therefore map your and then map your chimeric reads back to the genome to figure out which pairs of loci were interacting. And so the basic output of Hi C um, after doing all this kind of like mapping and a certain amount of filtering on the reads that you get to make sure that each read is really a chimeric read, what you essentially get out of a Hi C assay is a plot like I'm showing you here on the right. And so this plot should look similar to the dot plots that we talked about before where both kind of the rows and the columns represent uh, different genomic positions on the genome. And the dot represents uh, information about a pair of positions on the genome. And so those dots can either represent um, single base pair resolution or more commonly they represent whole regions like 40 KB windows um, along the genome. And so basically a red dot in this uh, table basically represents uh, an enrichment of interactions or a higher likelihood of those two regions uh, of the genome interacting more than you'd expect by chance. And basically white in this plot means that there's fewer interactions than you expect by chance. And so uh, just like with dot plots, you basically kind of see a diagonal uh, on a high C map, which typically means that, of course, a genomic loci tends to interact with itself because it, it is itself. And you, again, like we talked about on one of the previous lectures, you can see these kind of like blocks on the diagonal that correspond to whole genomic regions for which you see a lot of crosstalk within that region. And so something that we haven't really touched on yet, uh, but what is important is, is the bias that's inherent in, in these assays. And so for example, in the high C protocol, which I'm showing you here on the top right, again, uh, one of the most important aspects of that protocol is the enzyme digestion. Um, but one of the issues with enzyme digestion is that the efficiency of that digestion uh, kind of depends on the local GC content of the sequence around the cut site. And so here, for example, uh, for each of these graphs, I'm showing you the efficiency, the relative efficiency of two different restriction enzymes as a function of the GC content of either locus. So the y-axis is the GC content of one locus, and the x-axis is the GC content of the other locus. And you can see that even for the same cut site, um, the local GC content can, can vary and affect the efficiency of, of the cutting uh, along with it. And so these um, these bias patterns can look different for different enzymes. Uh, so the point here is that is that basically um, local sequence content and local sequence structure has substantial influence on the efficiency of, of these restriction enzymes. And so another area where efficiency comes into play is in the ligation uh, step of the assay. And so recall that after you, in high c for example, um, after you cut the uh, chromatin with your restriction enzyme and you add your biotin to the ends, uh, you need to ligate, um, ligate the ends so that chimeric reads form. And so part of the problem you have when you, uh, when you ligate your uh, different fragments to form chimeric reads is that if, for example, the fragments from the two different loci are about the same length, then uh, ligation is fairly easy to happen. But if one fragment is significantly shorter than the other, uh, then you run into problems in that it may not be sterically possible for the uh, ligation to happen, or there might be uh, excessive like looping or problems like that, uh, which prevent uh, ligation from successfully happening. 
And so shown on the right again is basically the uh, ligation efficiency. Uh, when you make uh, cuts using different enzymes and you consider the effect of, for example, length of one fragment versus the other. And so again here, you can see that um, two different restriction enzymes can have different biases in terms of uh, which fragment lengths that they prefer uh, in order for ligation to happen successfully. And so just to put um, high C, 3C, and 4C on the same page, basically here again on the left is a is an example of a uh, high, of the results of a high C assay uh, on a human cell line. Uh, and so here, basically I'm trying to illustrate the difference between what you get from high C, 3C, and 4C. So high C gives you this like 2D heat map that looks kind of like a dot plot. Um, those gray boxes on the plot actually correspond to regions of uh, chromosome one for which we couldn't actually map reads uh, to the genome there. So there's gray there because no reads are there primarily because we can't map to that region. Um, and what you can see is that basically 3C, the classic 3C based assay anyways, is like generating interaction data on just one square of this map. Because one square of this map, remember, corresponds to interactions between a pair of loci on the genome. And that's exactly what 3C tells you is it tells you about um, interactions between just two specific loci on the genome. Whereas 4C is really like giving you a row or a column out of this heat map. Because 4C again, rem remember, it gives you the interactions between one locus versus the entire rest of the genome uh, in theory. And so that's that's really like just pulling out a row out of this heat map. And so something useful to point out is um, the resolution of these different assays that we've just talked about. And so you might ask yourself, well, if high c can measure all possible interactions uh, in the genome, then why would I ever do use like 3C or 4C technologies if high c always gives you more data? And so there's a few reasons why you wouldn't use high c all the time, uh, but one of them is, is really resolution. Right? So the idea basically here is that with high c it's true that you uh, can potentially get uh, data on all the different interactions um, that are occurring in the genome. But in practice, because you need, in practice, you need a really high read coverage in order to detect all of those interactions. And so if you think about it within a single cell, um, a single genomic locus can really only be, can usually only really be uh, interacting with one other locus at a time. And so if you have loci, which for example, could and do interact with many other loci, you wouldn't be able to you wouldn't be able to detect all of those interactions with just um, cross-linking from one cell. You'd have to cross-link against many cells. And so in practice, you might need like millions and millions of cells just to get enough um, get enough genomic fragments that are properly cross-linked in order to really detect some certain interactions. Um, and oftentimes in practice, actually what ends up happening is that you end up dividing your genome into different bins or windows, and you consider each window just one locus or one basically column or row in your high c map. And so what that means is that the resolution of high c for any individual specific locus tends to be much lower than, for example, 3C, where you're designing primers for individual uh, restriction cut sites of your locus of interest. And so the resolution of like 3C technology, for example, is much higher for the target locus than it is for high C. Um, and so I've also uh, included um, assay, I've also included the resolution of like DAM ID, for example, which we talked about uh, in one of the earlier lectures. Um, I've also included ChIP-seq here, which is of slightly higher resolution than DAM ID. Um, and yeah, so this is just to give you a, a sense of, you know, when would you use say 3C versus high C if there's one specific locus that you really care about and that you really want to understand what it's interacting with, then 3C is typically uh, a better choice compared to like high C because if you only care about one locus in the genome, 
then it's a waste to sequence a lot of other interactions happening in the rest of the genome that you don't care about. So to be more precise about what kind of data comes out of a high C experiment, uh, basically, once you sequence your chimeric reads and you align uh, the ends of those chimeric reads uh, back to the original genome to figure out which uh, two loci were interacting to produce the chimeric read, basically what you can do is for every chimeric read that you sequence, you can then basically figure out which pair of uh, loci your reads came from. And you can basically create, again, this table that I'm showing you here represented by this heat map where the i throw and jth column, uh, the value stored at the i throw and jth column basically correspond to the number of reads that you sequenced, um, which basically represent an interaction between loci i, locus i, and locus j. And so essentially, this table represents a, a matrix of counts O, where yeah, OIG represents the number of reads uh, for which one end mapped to uh, locus i and one read map to locus j. And so again, the diagonal on this on this heat map or this O matrix basically tells you about um, the local interactions, which are likely in large part non-specific uh, between adjacent loci in the genome. And so looking at the raw kind of counts out of a high C experiment isn't is typically uh, not that common because, again, a lot of the interactions that you see in the raw uh, count matrix O are expected. So as I mentioned before, adjacent positions on the genome, for example, are expected to interact very frequently uh, because um, just because they're close uh, on the linear chromosome. And so obviously they're going to be found in close proximity uh, in 3D space frequently. And so what's a little bit more common is to do some kind of uh, what's called a normalization. And so what this means is that you can basically compute, um, basically there exists a lot of software that computes what you might call an expected read count. So given the depth of your sequencing, um, there's a lot of models out there which can basically tell you, okay, well, given that I expect that two positions that are close in linear, uh, in linear genome, genome space, to be more frequently interacting than pairs of loci that are far away on the linear chromosome, then I can compute what I basically expect in terms of the number of reads mapping to uh, each pair of loci just based on their linear proximity, for example. And then I can take my observed counts, I can divide out by my expected counts, and I can basically get rid of, for example, the large signal on the diagonal, which is um, something that which is a signal that I already expect and so wouldn't be really surprising. And so the goal of high c obviously is to tell you about interactions that you didn't expect ahead of time. Um, and so that's kind of the purpose of this normalization step. And so I've mentioned a number of times now uh, the term topologically associated domain. So an obvious question then is, you know, what do these tads represent? And so basically here in part A of this diagram, I'm showing you uh, a cartoon diagram of the nucleus, and I'm showing you how uh, chromosomes tend to segregate into chromosomal territories. Or chromosomal territory is basically just a region of the nucleus um, where a particular chromosome tends to reside more frequently than you'd expect by chance. And so the idea of TADS is that uh, chromosomal territories are kind of a, a nuclear organization feature at the at the level of like entire chromosomes, so TADs are uh, organize are certain organizational elements of the genome at a smaller scale, so at a higher level of resolution. And so TADs are typically short, or not short, but they're typically uh, sub segments of a chromosome where you see a lot of interactions within the TAD. A lot of physical interactions within the TAD, but not so much between TADs. And so the idea of a TAD is that within a TAD, um, these TADs are typically um, bounded by certain types of regulatory elements like CTCF binding sites. And within the TAD, you typically see a lot of crosstalk, a lot of interactions between, for example, uh, enhancers and promoters. And so the one of the um, working hypotheses of what these TADs represent is that um, the purpose of TADS is to 
kind of increase the amount of like cross-regulation between one enhancer, for example, and multiple target genes um, within the TAD, but it also helps these boundaries that are established by, for example, CTCF binding sites, help prevent enhancers within this TAD that I'm showing you here, for example, from activating genes in other TADs or in other regions of the genome that are even beside this TAD. And so in terms of a high C contact map, again, TADs are basically visualized as uh, blocks on this diagonal of this TAD or of this high C map. And so here's a cartoon diagram just showing you hypothetically where uh, for two blocks on this high C map shown on the left, these would correspond to regions of the genome that are generally uh, in close proximity in the nucleus. And so again, another point which is worth mentioning is that TADs, uh, a single TAD unit consists of um, one, continu one continuous section of one chromosome, and but the TADs themselves can assemble into larger compartments, these AB compartments. And so again, the A compartment generally corresponds to transcriptionally active regions, uh, where again, act, uh, TADs belonging to the same A compartment can even interact between, between themselves, even though these are cross-TAD interactions. Um, those a compartment regions also tend to have um, higher gene density and more chromatin accessibility, more active histone modifications. So all of the features that you generally expect of uh, regions of the genome that are being actively transcribed. And so in contrast, uh, the B compartment where a lot of TADs related to, um, you know, that tend to be transcriptionally repressed. Um, so those B compartment TADs tend to correspond to or have a lot of like inactive regions, uh, gene deserts or heterochromatin, um, and just a lot of interactions between inactive regions of the genome. Um, and so, yeah, again, this is these A B compartments are one of the one of the big discoveries that HiC made uh, earlier on when the technology was first uh, first developed. And so, it's worth pointing out that, in particular, um, one of the functional consequences of this A versus B compartment is that. The B compartment, for example, tends to associate itself with uh, different distinct nuclear structures. And so uh, compartment B, for example, tends to be found uh, close to the uh, nuclear lamina uh, that we talked about before. So they tend to form a lot of these LADs uh, that we were talking about earlier in the lecture. Um, and they also tend to sit in the interior near the nucleolus. Uh, whereas in contrast, the compartment A TADs uh, tend to sit in the um, in the interior of the nuclear space uh, between like the nucleolus and the lamina. And so this uh, what I'll call a ratio matrix that we calculated on the left slide by or the last slide by dividing the observed counts by the expected um, is typically uh, not actually directly used per se. So if you see the R matrix, uh, which is redrawn on the left, you'll see that where red means uh, more expected in more interactions than you expect by chance and blue means less. You can see that the difference between the red and the blue is, is not too striking. And so what people oftentimes do is that they take this R matrix, this racial matrix, and they compute a correlation matrix. And so the, in the correlation matrix, the correlation matrix is the same size as the racial matrix. So there's still uh, one row and one column for every uh, locus on your chromosome of interest. And so basically the, the difference is that, uh, the value that you see at row I and column J of the correlation matrix is calculated by looking at the row I and row J of the ratio matrix and just looking across all loci and just asking how correlated are the ratio of the counts of row I and row J on the left. And that gives you the, uh, the value you see in the I row and J column of the correlation matrix. And so the point here is that the correlation is going to be high when loci I and J uh, share a lot of neighbors in the ratio matrix. And so basically the idea is that if two loci are close by in 3D space in the nucleus, then uh, they will tend to interact. And if they tend to interact, then that means that 
the other loci that they're each individually interacting with will also tend to be shared because that just means everybody's in the same region of 3D space in the nucleus. And so you can see immediately just at a high level that the correlation matrix is, uh, it has a lot more kind of uh, clear distinctions between the red and the blue regions uh, of the map. And more importantly, if you kind of look at the whole at the table as a whole, you can kind of see a banding pattern. So if you look across the rows, for example, from top to bottom, you can see that there's basically two general classes of rows um, and they kind of alternate between each other. And so you can, yeah, if you just kind of scan from the top row down to the bottom row, you can kind of see that there's like a flipping of, of different types of rows uh, as you go from top to bottom. And so it turns out that what that flipping of uh, you know different row types is what it represents is uh, is basically the division of loci into A and B compartments. And so that was one of the big findings of HiC um, when it was first invented. And so the idea here is that basically uh, you can see blocks of row blocks of rows that are close to each other tend to form. Um, tend to look similar. And so tads basically are represented by the rectangles uh, that you see in this diagram. And where you see swap switching between, for example, a red, red block in one set of rows and a blue block underneath it is basically, uh, are basically boundaries between two different tads. And so the reason why you see this kind of banding pattern is you go from the top to the bottom row is that uh, basically the rows that look the same in this table tend to correspond to one compartment, say the A compartment, and the other set of rows tend to correspond to the B compartments. And so we'll discuss this more on the next slide, but basically, you, again, your AB compartments tend to correspond to regions of the genome that uh, are either in transcriptionally active or A compartments, or they're in transcriptionally inactive or B compartments. Um, and so one of the ways in which people identify which compartment your, you know, a given uh, locus in the genome sits in is through running a statistical analysis called principal components analysis. And so we'll discuss more in the human genetics lecture what exactly principal components analysis is. But basically, um, for the purposes of this lecture, the only thing that you really need to know is that principal components analysis calculates different principal components, and so PC stands for principal components, and PC1 is kind of the most important one. And so if you look at PC1, PC1 basically um, assigns a value, either negative or positive, to every row in this correlation matrix. And so if you look at the PC1 values as you scan from top to bottom, you again also kind of see a banding pattern where you'll see a whole bunch of rows point in one direction, and then all of a sudden it'll be like a very um, pronounced switch to the other side and back to the other side to negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, and so on. And if you look closely at the rows of the correlation matrix, where the PC1 values switch from negative, and po negative to positive and back basically correspond to where the banding pattern switches as well. And so the point here is that when you use this principal components analysis and you calculate this PC1, basically where the values switch from positive to negative and back basically indicate to you where the uh, where a potential boundary in a tad is and all of the rows that correspond to negative pc values correspond to you know one of the ab compartments and all of the values all of the rows that get a you know let's say a positive value of pc1 basically correspond to uh, loci in the other compartment so I spent a bunch of time talking about um, how to identify uh, TAD structures in AB compartments, um, but I want to spend a little bit of time talking about one particular feature of blocks on the diagonal, and that's the so-called corner dot. And so part A of this diagram is basically showing you half of a high c heat map. So if you look closely on the previous slides, um, high c heat maps are symmetric, right? And so if you look on one side of the diagonal compared to the other, uh, they look symmetric. And the reason for that is that if you think about what the ijth entry of 
uh, the high C heat map represents versus the J ith uh, entry of the heat map. Basically, the I J ith and J ith uh, entries in the heat map tell you about the interactions between locus I and locus J versus locus J and locus I. And so those should be the same thing um, in general, anyways. Um, and so oftentimes, actually, when people visualize he high C heat maps, they don't show the whole heat map because essentially it's half of one duplicated. And so oftentimes what you actually see is basically just half the high C heat map uh, shown as a triangle. Um, and so the x-axis here represents uh, the diagonal that we typically see on a high C heat map. And everything above it is basically just one half of the high C heat map. And so part A again shows you basically a large scale high C heat map. And you know, just like the previous high C heat maps we saw, um, you see typically a lot of blocks on the, on the diagonal corresponding to tads and what are known as subtads. And you see larger banding structure due to the AB compartments. And so here again, I'm just showing you uh, basically two, uh, basically rows below, immediately below the heat map. One, the top of which basically shows you again kind of PC1, which as you recall, tells you something about which regions are in the A versus B compartment. So here I'm just showing you PC1 um, basically colored based on whether the sign of that PC1 was positive or negative. And you can see basically the boundaries between the blue and the red segments correspond to CAD boundaries uh, in this picture. Uh, the second row basically shows you a hypothetical uh, plot about how much expression might be observed at any given locus within uh, this chromosome. And basically the point is that uh, you can see that certain tads tend to be mostly blue or mostly red, uh, corresponding again to whether or not that tad belongs to the A or, B, A or B compartment. So part B kind of zooms in on one larger tad. And uh, the point of the part B of this figure is that tads are oftentimes hierarchical. And so within one block, you might see smaller, more well-defined blocks. Um, and this, is, this occurs because um, when certain loops are very large and very long range across a chromosome, you can have mini loops within the larger loop. And so you can see within part B of the figure that I've illustrated CTCF binding sites. And you can see that CTCF binding sites tend to occur at the boundaries between the blocks or basically where the boundaries of TADs are or subtads. Uh, and so that's because CTCF plays an important role in the formation of those uh, boundaries and of TADs in general. Part C zooms in specifically on one particular subtad from B. And basically the point here is that sometimes when you see these blocks on the diagonal, sometimes you can see a very prominent dot right at the corner of the block. So that's represented by the big point, red point at the top of the triangle in part C. And so if you think about what that point represents, that point basically says that the two genomic loci corresponding to the boundaries of this block are in close tight interaction. And so what that means, if you think about the, if you think about the implications of that dot on the 3D structure of the chromatin of this region, you basically get a model like what I'm showing you on the right here of part C, where basically that corner dot represents a very close interaction of two distal genomic loci. Um, and because those two genomic loci represent the boundaries of TADs, what oftentimes you actually observe is that that corner dot represents close physical contact of the distant genomic loci that are brought together by uh, the cohesin complex interacting with CTCF. Um, and so basically what these corner dots represent is a very tight chromosome loop um, that occurs between the boundaries of, for example, this TAD. And so before we get into uh, the, the discussion about how cohesin and CTCF uh, potentially induce looping uh, in chromatin, I just wanted to show you a uh, an actual real high C map shown here on the right, which corresponds to uh, a high C map derived from mouse cortical neurons. And basically, on this high C map, you can basically see a couple uh, block diagonals, also kind of highlighted on the high C map uh, with different colored lines. And where I've pointed with an arrow, you can actually see 
a very prominent corner dot. Um, and so not all tad, you'll see that not all tads on this diagram, or not all blocks on this diagram have a corner dot, but those corner dots that you see are very prominent and very obvious. And again, what they indicate is some kind of um, looping that is facilitated by um, cohesion and CTCF. And so on the left, um, what I'm actually showing you is, uh, is basically the structure of um, the predicted model structure of chromatin when you have two different styles of uh, two different styles of corner dots. And so in part B of the figure on the left, you can see that there's kind of uh, two subtads within the block and a single corner dot up at the very top. And so what you could infer about the chromatin structure from that type of tad is that there's only one single looping event. Um, and that's kind of shown by the, uh, by the cohesion plus uh, two blue circles, which correspond to two CTCF uh, regulators. Uh, and you can see that the two subtads just correspond to two different parts of the same loop uh, that happen to interact with each other more than between the two parts of the loop. Whereas on the right half of the part B diagram, you can see that there's actually two corner dots instead of just one. Um, and so the correct chromatin model that corresponds to this uh, high C map is basically one in which there's actually two loops forming and both ends of both loops go through the same cohesion complex. And so basically on the right, you can see there's actually like four, um, four ovals corresponding to four CTCF uh, molecules. And uh, basically you can actually see that there's two different loops passing through the same cohesion molecule. And so the point here is that uh, the block structure of the high C map in conjunction with the corner dots can tell you, uh, can basically distinguish different subtle structures uh, or microstructures within the chromatin in different regions of the, of the genome. And so a big question that actually hasn't been entirely resolved is the question of how do these loops form in the first place? And so that's still, so I want to emphasize that how loops form exactly is still unknown, but there are obviously hypotheses about how loops form. And so the loop extrusion model is one common hypothesis for how loops form. And so the general idea is that, um, is that basically the cohesion complex, which is made up of a bunch of other protein domains called structural maintenance of chromosomes, uh, proteins like SMC1, SMC3, and RAD21 uh, basically come together to form cohesin, and then cohesin gets loaded onto the chromatin uh, through complexes like NIPBL. And so the idea is that once cohesin is loaded onto, um, onto the chromosome, then looping starts to happen, and uh, the chromosome basically gets fed through or extrusion starts to happen. And basically extrusion keeps happening until... Uh, some bound, uh, until some probably bound CTCF binding sites, so those binding sites that are bound by CTCF, uh, then start physically interacting with cohesin and basically prevent extrusion from continuing. Um, and that's how, that's why CTCF bounding sites are frequently found at the boundaries of these TADs. Um, and so uh, extrusion and, and Binding by cohesin isn't a isn't typically a permanent event, so uh, cohesin can be released from the chromosome, um, and it's typically released through the activity of regulators like WPL. So an interesting question is, um, you know, what happens to the organization of the genome when you start to perturb some of these uh, components of the uh, loop extrusion model. And so in part A of this diagram, part A basically shows you uh, a hypothetical high C heat map along with the different blocks on the diagonal and the corner dots uh, corresponding to like a control normal functioning cell. And so the idea is that in part B, part B is 
uh, this diagram shows you what happens potentially if you, for example, knock down CTCF. And so the idea is that CTCF again uh, is what uh, is what stops. It, it not only stops extrusion from occurring further, but it also actually uh, serves to bring together the two distal loci into close proximity uh, within the interactions with the cohesin complex. And so one of the major uh, one of the major features of a high CMAP uh, that occur when you lose CTCF interactions is that you lose that corner dot because um, uh, you don't see an enrichment of interactions between those distal loci that meet at the cohesin complex. Uh, the second thing you notice is that uh, a number of the sub-TAD structures start to disappear because again, if you don't have CTCF there to kind of explicitly stop extrusion, extrusion from happening, um, extrusion can still uh, change dynamics based it, it potentially could change dynamics based on whether the CTCF binding site is seen there or not anyways, um, just because uh, the uh, certain parts of the cohesion complex recognize sequences that tend to co-locate with CTCF binding sites. Um, and so that's why you don't see complete loss of TAD structure, but uh, you do see loss of certain like sub-TAD structures in there, for example. And so part C of the diagram shows you what happens if you... Uh, if you have depleted cohesin in your cell. And so basically, again, the, the point of cohesin is to um, is to facilitate chromosome looping. And so if you have no looping because you have no cohesin, then that basically means that you lose a lot of your TAD structure. And so basically what you see in the high C heat map for part C is uh, you you basically lose a lot of TAD structure and um, what you end up seeing is that um, you still see by and large formation of AB compartments because you see a lot of banding in the high C map, but you lose a lot of the actual, like, uh, the TAD structure. And so part D shows you what happens when you deplete WPL. So again, WPL is the uh, complex that helps release um, cohesion from the chromosome. And so the problem you have is that if you lose WPL, then you, your cohesion basically doesn't get released from the chromosome. And so, uh, you might get even more looping than you, than you would have if you had WPL there. And so compared to part A, you can see that there's more corner dots corresponding to more looping happening. And because there's more looping happening and the looping doesn't ever get released, then what happens is that the uh, AB compartment distinction is uh, not as prominent because um, because everything is kind of fixed in place more so than in the control cell. So I want to highlight how high C interaction maps can tell you something about how gene regulation changes under conditions and not just about the 3D structure of chromatin. So here's an example of a pair of high C maps derived from uh, the mouse liver. Uh, and it's this, I'm just showing you one piece of chromosome one. And the point here is that if you compare the uh, high C maps between these two points in the circadian clock, um, you can see that there's some fairly large scale changes in the 3D structure of the chromatin uh, in the highlighted region. And so in particular, below each uh, below each of the zoomed in areas of the high C maps, uh, what's drawn there is an illustration of how the, how the three dimensional structure of the chromatin uh, can inform a model of how the different regulatory elements in that region interact with the promoter uh, of a local gene. And so the point here is that on the left at time point ZT22, uh, the 3D structure of the chromatin basically implies that there's close interactions between a pair of enhancers and the promoter of that particular gene. Whereas under Z, at the time point ZT10, uh, there's no long range physical interaction implied by the pair of enhancers to the uh, promoter gene, which suggests that at that time point, the gene is turned off. And so the point here is that looking at how TAD structure changes across cellular contexts can teach you something about 
how gene regulation is changing between those contexts, even if all you see is basically the 3D structure of the chromatin. Another utility of the 3C-based assays is to identify the molecular effect of uh, different types of genetic variation uh, on, on gene regulation. And so here's an example of a study that uh, identified a number of uh, structural variations, in this case, uh, like inversions and deletions, uh, in a small number of uh, human individuals uh, that were associated with limb malformations in humans. And so they wanted to understand what the effect of uh, those potential mutations were on gene regulation. And so what they did is that uh, they ran a series of experiments uh, in mice, where for the corresponding region in mouse, uh, they engineered uh, similar mutations in the mouse genome and tested the effect of those mutations using the 4C assay. And so part A in this diagram shows you the wild type locus in mouse. Uh, and also drawn on the diagram is the boundaries of a TAD that was identified through 4C and high C. So the idea here is that in parts B and C and D, uh, what they did is they introduced different mutations that they found in the humans with, uh, with the rare limb malformations. What they found in each one of these three cases is that when they introduced the uh, uh, corresponding mutation using CRISPR, uh, you can see that each one of these mutations that they investigated uh, involved some kind of structural variant that crosses the TAD boundary. And so you can see uh, in part B, for example, that the 4C assay tells you that um, the genomic regions around PAX3 uh, have a lot of self-interactions, but they don't have any interactions that really cross uh, into the uh, into the TAD region, but after you uh, delete part of the three prime boundary, then you get uh, you get physical interactions between uh, one of the enhancers in the PAX3 locus and the region inside the TAD. And the same holds for parts C and D as well. And so the main point here is that uh, using assays like 4C, high C, and so on, uh, you can uh, engineer mutations and and basically investigate the molecular effect of, of genetic variation. And so getting back to a question that we touched on earlier, which is why would you ever use te techniques like 3C, 4C, and 5C versus say high C? So before I mentioned uh, that one potential reason is that high C has in effect lower resolution. Um, and so a uh, along the same similar lines, one of the problems with high C is that again you're measuring all possible pairwise interactions between genomic loci. And so if you consider HIN3, for example, if you use HIN3 as a restriction enzyme, HIN3 will generate um, in the human genome anyways, somewhere around the order of 10 to the 12th um, possible interactions that it could be assaying in a single experiment. And so obviously getting enough uh, coverage, so getting enough input uh, genomic sequence from many different cells is actually it's actually pretty hard. And so your coverage of the interactions for any given short region, say like 100 base pairs, is really, really bad. And so uh, one of the common ways that you get around this is by binning your high C read. So instead of um, when you draw that high C map and you consider the interactions between pairs of loci, one of the ways in which you can address uh, address the coverage problem is by increasing the width of those windows so that each dot in your high C map represents possible interactions between bigger and bigger regions um, of the genome. And so of course, that can help address your coverage problem, but what that means is that you lose resolution. And so one of the biggest problems again with high C is that compared to say 3C is that you lose resolution for any given individual locus. And so answering the question of which technology should you use in order to assay chromatin structure, um, sorry, chromatin organization, you really have to ask yourself the question, what are your, what's the goals of your study? And so for example, if your goals, if the goal of your study primarily is to study kind of large scale genomic confirmation analysis, so to try to identify 
you know, which regions of the genome, broadly speaking, are in A versus B compartments and study how these A, B compartment uh, assignments change across different cellular contexts, <clears throat> then it makes sense to use technologies like high c and sort of make your bins big um, and things like this. If your goal is to really study promoter enhancer interactions for a single promoter, a single locus, then it makes much more sense to use technologies like 3C and 4C because you'll just get better coverage of the locus that you design primers for. Um, another possible problem with high c and that's related to getting enough coverage, is that um, the uh, the library complexity is heavily affected by the amount of input material you have. And so library complexity generally refers to the number of unique molecules inside your library. And so for high c that amounts to asking how many unique chimeric molecules um, do you have in your library? And that's really affected by the number of input cells. And so if your number of input cells to your high c assay is small, then you typically need to do PCR amplification, for example, which may lead to lower library complexity. Um, and so if you have low library complexity, that means that no matter how deep sequencing you do, you're still just not going to get very good coverage of your, um, of your interactions. Um, and so, uh, as a final note, um, an often asked question then is, well, how many, you know, assuming that the, uh, library complexity is not issue, then how many reads should I map? Um, in order to get sufficient coverage of, say, the human genome uh, for any given high C interaction uh, assay. And so in general, that's, that's a pretty difficult pro uh, question to answer because it depends, again, usually when you do even a high C assay, there is some um, number of uh, loci which are typically of more interest than others. Um, but essentially, most I think most people generally assume that about 100 million uh, mapped reads is usually enough if you make your bins wide, like say 40 KB in size. So obviously if you need, if you want smaller bins, then you're going to need more reads than that and hopefully higher library complexity. But about 100 million reads for about 40 KB with uh, wide windows is, is about right.